right, ladies and gentlemen, today we have a great guest coming on board for our uh, Property and Finance podcast. We have Jared Zach, uh, the founder and principal of Dot and Crossette. Uh, Jared's been working with our team for over five years, maybe close to more like 10. Um, he helps all our clients' needs in terms of uh, legal needs, uh, legal requirements, um, both from a purchasing point of view, a selling point of view, um, sometimes even a estate planning point of view. Yeah, yeah. Um, we thought Jared would be a great person to come on board and talk about some of the big changes we've seen with stamp duty, the stamp duty reform that is for first home buyers. Um, also some risks associated with purchasing or selling a property, um, things like, you know, 5% deposit versus 10%. Um, so yeah, Jared, welcome aboard. Thanks mate. Yeah. Good to be here. So let's, um, let's touch on the, uh, stamp duty reform. So lots of myths out there. I feel big issue for us is that um, we're witnessing consumers actually aren't across what it even is, what it even means, how it even works. They see the words tax. They think they're paying more in annual land tax than the upfront stamp duty. You know, all in all, how do you feel about it? I think it's a great incentive, right? Yeah, I think it's uh, fantastic. Um, for a few years now, um, the existing stamp duty concessions have been almost irrelevant just because of you know, the thresholds having been surpassed with house price appreciation, particularly in Sydney. Um, and there was a big sort of pocket of first time home buyers, you know, around the one to $1.5 million budgets who just completely missed out. Mm. So this is a great opportunity to get them involved and it might be just what the property market needs, I think. Mm. So let's talk about what you, um, how it works. So if there's obviously still the waivers and discounts up to a certain price. Why don't we run yep. through that? They're, they're still all there and you can still use those. So the most effective one, um, which you can still use, is a complete stamp duty uh, exemption for properties that are less than $650,000. And there's a sliding concession all the way up to $850,000. So you get your most bang for the buck under $650,000. Not too many properties in Sydney around that level. So that's, that's sort of the point I, I mentioned before. Um, so that's the existing one. Um, it's a little bit different for vacant land. I think the, um, the exemption's a little bit lower. I think it's about $450,000. Um, and there still is a $10,000 cash grant if you're building something new in New South Wales. Great. <coughs> and so then from eight fifty to one point five, dollars you can opt in for the uh, <coughs> upfront stamp duty or the annual land tax. Um, a few myths we've calculated on, on our end. A lot of people think that you're going to end up paying more in um, annual land tax than the upfront stamp duty um, for owner occupiers, which this is you know designed to to um, be catered toward. Uh, it's 0.3 percent of the land value, and if we assume that the land tax is 0.3 percent of the land value, that is, if we assume a 2.5 percent annual growth rate on the land value. We've calculated a break-even point of about 14 years, meaning it'll be 14 years before the annual land tax becomes more than the upfront stamp duty. So in my opinion, for first home buyers, that's a fantastic win because most first home buyers only own their property for five or six years, right? Yeah. Uh, no, it's a, it's a no-brainer from that perspective. When you, when you did those um, calculations, did you find it any different between sort of Torrens title and apartments? No, we just used, we went on um, the OSR and just did some uh, land tax assessment notice sort of cal calculations at different price brackets. It was actually, I think, CoreLogic's data as well that they released about the, yeah. the topic. Um, why? Do you think that should vary? Well, no, I don't know if it would necessarily vary. I guess the yearly increases would probably be the same. So I guess that 14-year mark might still be the same. But I just note that land value, because don't forget, it's on, it's on land value, not property value. So mm. apartments land value, um, what can be quite low. You can buy you know, an apartment in New South Wales for $1.5 million. The land value can be as low as $400,000. Mm. So that, that's the, the yearly property tax you're paying is really, really low. A little bit different if you're buying a freestanding property, maybe in the western suburbs of New South Wales. You know, if the property price is $1.5 million, the land value could be as high as $1 million. Let's elaborate on that because a lot of people actually don't understand that there is a land value to units and apartments because um, effectively you own a proportionate amount of the overall land of the site. And yes, um, sometimes in a scheme like this, there is definitely... Uh, uh, sort of benefit you could say to being a, um, a purchaser of an apartment rather than a house but it's big case by case because what we have figured out is that 
for those traditional smaller Art Deco style blocks, which some are underdeveloped and there might be, let's say, two stories on a plot of land of apartments with, you know, let's say 16 apartments, which could be developed into 30 or 40 apartments. Land value is high. Sometimes the land value is really high. Yeah. But the brand new stuff or the stuff that's been, let's say, built in the last five or 10 years, the land value is really low yeah. because the developers come come along and, it's been exhausted and opti yeah. optimize the site. So it's you have to have a look at that. You have to, um, it's case by case is because I've seen some, some crazy land tax um, bills on, old small apartment blocks um, and it's purely because the, the there's opportunity to, to develop um, we should also touch on um, something that I've you know been in even um, seminars and it's been debated about in front of me what was well if you buy the property and you opt in for the annual land tax and five years later you end up selling the property um, you know, that means you've technically, if it's 14 years for break even, you've pretty much effectively only paid one third of the upfront stamp duty. Um, some people seem to think that you're on the hook for the residual amount being the two thirds left. Well, it's wrong, but there's, mm. a, there's a reason why people have that misconception, Theo, and, and that is because the first edition of the legislation did actually say that. Oh, it did. So that, that's why people have that, mi that misunderstanding. But the um, it obviously got debated and it got thrown out as being you know, just far too complex. Mm. And so the, the existing legislation absolutely says you do not have to pay whatever the theoretical remaining outstanding stamp duty is. So you just have to pay, you just have to have paid your annual property tax and mm. then you'll get a clear, what we call property tax certificate to be able to sell your property unencumbered um, to, the, to the buyer. Does that mean we're probably going to see more and more changes around this topic rolling out to the greater market in terms of not just first home buyers, but um, upsizers, downsizers, investors, and some of those topics like that one right there might come into play? 100%. You, you and I have discussed this before. Um, you know, um, I don't think Dominic Perrottet was going around saying so much that he wanted to support first time home buyers a few years ago. The big rhetoric was he, he doesn't like stamp duty, it's mm. an efficient tax. So my view, and I think mm. you agree, don't you, is that uh, this is probably just the first vehicle. Mm. And if it, if it all works, then it'll open up to another category of buyer. Do, mm. do, do you yeah, there was a discussion <coughs> paper released, I think back in 2020, um, around abolishing stamp duty altogether. And that um, it would, yeah, if, you, if a property had been opted in for the annual land tax, the next purchaser that comes along has to opt in for annual land tax as well. You can't change it back. Um, there is definitely some pros and cons. I think one defi definite benefit is that stamp duty does become a bit of a roadblock or a hindrance to transacting often. You know, um, people don't, you know, let's say someone bought a house for a certain price, call it $2 million, and they went to, they found another house for around the same price, only two, three, late, two, three years later, I should say. Um, but they, they just paid you know, 90 grand in stamp duty, it, it's it's like, well, hang on, am I going to pay 2% to the agent, 4.5% to the state government just to move from the uh, same price property to another? That's, you know, it's 6.5% yeah. in, in transactional costs, call it. it. It becomes a roadblock. And they're like, well, you know what? No, I'll just stay put. I've got to wait for some growth. Um, I don't want to pay stamp duty again. So it there might be family reasons, job mobility reasons. There might be really good social reasons as to why they should move. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they can't. exactly right. So yeah. um, I think it's it does make uh, the property market a little bit more um, less turnover, more restricted in terms of volume. The last two years we've seen uh, a lot less volume of of sales. So there's been a lot less revenue than than usual. Um, although prices are higher. It's still hard for them to forecast, you know, and, and budget for. So, mm. I think an annual land tax, which is what they have in other countries like New Zealand, um, yeah. New Zealand <coughs> America, I think the UK as well. Um, yeah. They they have an annual land tax, which um, is much much easier for, for the governments to budget with. Um, any other sort of important shout outs you should say about the stamp duty well, reform? Well, just don't forget, um, it is, we've been using the word land tax because it, it is conceptually a land tax. I think the actual terminology the government are using is property tax, which mm. is actually confusing because it's not a tax on the property, it's a tax on the land. Mm. But don't forget, there is also land tax. So they haven't got rid of that. That's still this nasty little thing that, that you'll pay if you're an investor. Or if it's your second or third property. Well, yeah, yeah. Sorry, you're right. It doesn't have to be investment. It could just mm. be a holiday house that you paid on. Mm. Um, 
So just be careful of that. Um, and you can definitely be in a situation uh, where you're paying both this property tax and the land tax. Yeah, but they are taxes that will be tax deductible if it's an investment property. Um, so the million dollar question that people get, uh, that we get asked, and I'll, I'll be curious to know how you answer this, is um, is one better than the other? Would you be recommending stamp duty or annual land tax? I've got enough to advise my clients on <laughs> <laughs> getting into that yeah. kind of thing, but occasionally I, I am asked, and and my understanding at the moment is that you know, to me it seems a bit of a no-brainer. I, w- I would be op- I would be opting in for that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Especially if you don't think you're going to own that property for more than 14 years, yeah. right? Yeah. It's also the the um, people don't the, the value of money up front. You know, you, you're paying a lump sum up front or just paying it over a period of time. You'd rather pay it over a period of time, especially if it's that 14 years. Yeah. Um. All right. So. Moving on from the, the stamp duty reform, um, let's talk about you know what you're seeing day to day with your 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 um, vendors, your buyers. What are some of the risks? So um, one that we love to talk about is some of the biggest risks that uh, purchasers or consumers aren't aware of when entering into a contract, um, especially in the Sydney market, which is probably our core market. Um, your five biggest shout outs. What would you have to say? Yeah, well, we, we can talk about sort of defects in title and you know, disputes with neighbours and contaminated land, and those things do exist, and maybe we'll talk about those, but the biggest risk actually is, is something that, that you, know, you, you, know, you would see as well, um, whereby people are expected to bid at either auctions or under semi-auction conditions with a 66W, and I can explain what that is in a moment, but once they buy a contract under those conditions or enter into a contract under that, those conditions, they are bound unconditionally. Mm. And it means that they're taking a bit of a leap of faith um, with their bank, uh, both in terms of valuation, sometimes in terms of pre-approval. Mm. So, I mean, sometimes there's a lot of pressure actually on yourself and mm. your brokers when they've bought at auction and there's still quite a few hoops to, to, to jump through. So for all our <laughs> listeners that aren't across um, or haven't purchased a property or they have and it's been some time, let's elaborate on that. So at an auction... If you're bidding and you win, you buy the property unconditionally. There's no cooling off period. That's it. You've got to come up with the money. End of story. Um, but in Sydney in particular, this 66W is when if, you, if you're not buying it at auction and you're buying it you know, just as a uh, before auction or for a property that's just listed for sale, the most agents want you to just sign a 66W, which is effectively the same terms. You're buying it unconditionally, no cooling off, and you're, you're, you're locked in, right? Hundred percent, and that seems to be the market for anything east of Parramatta, um, mm. anything south of Gosford. Really, um, it, it's all, almost all sixty six W, even in the market right now. Um, so you know, and, and what we what we are seeing uh, the last six months is actually you know occasionally uh, valuation slipping. So people buying a property at auction for a million dollars, and then the value are coming on the Monday or the Tuesday and saying, "Well, congratulations, but the bank only thinks it's worth nine hundred and fifty." And there's not much we can do about that, no, really, there's not. other than just to try and get our buyers to be conservative. Or, well, from our point of view, we just have to organise um, additional valuations of different banks. But at the moment, that's not that easy in the sense that we probably chose a particular bank for a certain reason because they were probably going to be the most com- accommodating as a borrowing power is the bigger objective that most of our clients are, are trying to achieve at the moment. Um, can, I, can I ask, are, are you able to appeal valuations with a bank? Oh, I think something like 15% of valuations that we appeal actually result in a different outcome, yep. as in you know a different valuation amount. Um, you're basically they trying... They quite defensive, don't they? Yeah, that's yep. about to say. You're, you're <coughs> basically telling you the valuer whose job five days a week is to value property that, hey, you're doing your job wrong. So um, no matter what comparables you send, it's very rare that we um, result in a different outcome. Um, just going back on this this, this whole uh, CC6W process and you, in those boundaries you mentioned, you know, east of Parramatta, both your business and our business, um, we both operate in, you know, Queensland and, and Victoria. And this isn't a thing in Queensland and Victoria. In, in Queensland... And uh, in, I think both actual markets, they get a standard two-week or maybe even a three-week cooling off, right? Absolutely. It, it, it's a phenomena, um, and I don't understand it. Um, it, it. You know, both Queensland and Victoria, particularly Queensland, vastly different. Um, you know, th- there's not that many auctions in Queensland to start with. There are some. It's increasing a little bit. But uh, in terms of the private treaty contracts, there's almost always a finance date and a finance condition. So you sign a contract almost straight away, 
and you'll have 14 days to get finance. And if you haven't got it by that date, you get out, you get all of your money back, mm. every, every cent. And it's the same thing with pest and building. So you do a pest and building inspection and if, if something comes back adverse with the property, um, you can also have your, your money back. And Sydney w- or New South Wales will not have a bar of that. Yeah, why? It's so much more ruthless uh, here. It's like, <laughs> it's like the, the market's <coughs> much hotter here or something and they're just assuming if you want it, buy it and you can't wiggle out of it no matter what. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have an answer for you for that. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough one. Yeah. Um, so what are some other risks? You know, what are, what are you seeing at the moment or have you seen over, over your, your tenure in the, in the legal industry? Um, well, you've probably heard this statistic before, but they reckon that there's probably close to 15 to 20% um, of structures on, um, on Torrens title property in New South Wales are unapproved by council. Oh, yeah. Um, and that can be quite a bad thing. Mm. Um, so, for example, a buyer, they, they buy a property with a lovely granny flat out the back or, um, you know, or, or, or a garage out the back. Now, that, that garage or, or, um, or granny flat may not be approved by council. Um, and if they buy that and they've settled and a year later, council come around and say that wasn't approved, they can knock it down. Mm, and, and the agent's <laughs> probably pitching it as part of the value and the buyers probably put, uh, purchased it thinking, oh, it's got a you know granny flat um, or it's got a garage and it's basically being advertised like that, yep. right? Yeah. And there's only so much you can you can do. I mean, you can ask the vendor, um, you know, is it approved? Um, and sometimes they'll be quite forthcoming and say, no, it's not. And that's great. At least you can sort of know what you're dealing with. You can sort of understand the risk and price mm. it accordingly. But the frustrating answer that we get a lot of the time is, look, we don't know. We, you know, we bought the property two years ago. We don't know. Um, so and, how th- and then you can go to council and theoretically you can go to council and say, well, I want, I want the full files handed over to me, but have a guess how long that takes. Mm. <laughs> that's, that's a couple of weeks at best. So, but how are <laughs> valuers um, finding these issues? They must be going to council and doing the valuation. Valuers, funnily enough, don't get in that involved in this. It's a funny thing. They get involved in other things, you know, the cladding, combustible cladding on yeah. strata apartments. They're obsessed with that at the moment. But they rarely will say something like, you know, we're not going to value this at full, full price because we suspect the outside, outside granny flat is not council approved. It's probably going beyond their level of expertise. Because, mm. um, I mean, if the solicitor, conveyancer, vendor's agent, buyer can't determine whether it's council approved, then mm. I doubt a valuer can as well. Let's the touch on that combustible <coughs> cladding because that is a hot topic at the moment after that. Uh, it's a long time ago now, but the Greenfall sort of um, fire in London, um, the, all the buildings locally here, the building we're in right now at present is being um, re uh, sort of furbished, you could say, on the outside. They're redoing all the facade to get rid of the combustible cladding and a lot of apartment blocks, a lot of um, buildings have these issues and banks straight out won't take them as security, right? Yeah, it, I don't know about you, but I find this super annoying because as you sort of said from the outset, it's not a new issue. It, mm. it, it's now we're probably going to the fifth or sixth year that it's been on the radar of strata managers and people and they know what they need to do and it's a costly exercise and um, there are a lot of people out there trying to make a lot of money out of these works orders and that kind of thing. But m- the vast majority of buildings are addressing it. Mm. They've funded it um, and they're addressing it. Mm. Um, and, and it's all set out in the strata report for our clients and they know it and they price it into their purchase price. And then you get a valuer come along and say, oh, it's got combustible cladding. The bank is not lending full stop. Mm. And, and, and we're like, well, we know it's got combustible cladding. There's it's being 300, addressed. There's 300 grand in the, in the sinking yeah. fund for that. Yeah. And I found that really, really frustrating. We've had at least two lenders in the last, uh, this year um, who have pulled out. Mm. Um, have you had any experience with that? Or? Yeah, yeah, we're definitely seeing a lot of it. Um, question is, it should now be in every strata report, right? As in, Correct. you're not going to buy a property and then later find out, oh, it's got combustible cladding. It's probably addressed and being dealt with in every single... 100%. Um, yeah, yeah it's, that, it's that, that risk that you identified, that might have been applicable maybe three or four years ago. You mm. might have got a, you know, a self-managed property. It'd be rarely that there'd be a self-managed property has a combustible cladding issue because it tends to be mm. for the bigger properties anyway. Um, but you might have had um, a, str- a building that's a little bit behind the eight ball, um, but almost every strata manager, I'd say, would now be completely atop the top of this. If they haven't got quotes, if they haven't fixed it, then they're, they're certainly on the way to doing it. It's all sort of um, factored in. This isn't just also for um, units. Some I've seen um, asbestos, for example, can be an issue with houses. Um, valuers come in and somehow can tell there's uh, asbestos on site and banks won't yeah. touch that either. Um, I, I have seen that as well, yeah. So um, let's all move on to maybe these uh, deposit conversations. So... Um, <clears throat> big question that we always get asked, you know, why, why, why do I need to put a 10% down? Can I put a 5% down? What's the difference both from the 
buyer point of view and the vendor, the seller, you know, um, what's what's each party's um, interest and what, what, what would you suggest? Before I get into that, just one, one thing it's, it's worth mentioning. Um, do, you, do you get a lot of clients who get the contractual deposit mixed up with the, the deposit in the mortgage sense? So, oh, yeah. Sometimes yeah. they realize um, later that, they thought the deposit, yeah, that well, could, especially for so green it, buyers. It, being it, first it, home it buyers. is worth mentioning that the deposit is used in two different senses when you're buying a house. Yeah, so, good point. Because um, we get a lot of people say, oh, no, Theo, Theo said we have to pay a 20% deposit. Why are you saying we have to do 10? I'm like, no, no, that's something different. That's your equity yes. relative to the bank's loan. Yep. Um, so we like to call it equity, I guess. I don't know mm. what you guys are calling it equity or deposit. Yeah, it is the equity what. component. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're talking about the contractual deposit here. And that contractual deposit will actually most times make up your equity when it comes to settlement. So for example, if Theo's doing a loan for you and you need to put 20% down, I will get the 10% when we sign the contract and, and we'll give that to the agent and then I'll get the remaining 10% plus stamp duty um, at settlement. Um, mm. So that, that's what we mean when we say, um, when we say uh, contractual deposit. So the question is, or the question we're getting at the moment is, um, you know, what's the difference between 5% and 10%? Can we get a 5% deposit? Should we go for that? I mean, the answer almost always is yes. I mm. mean... I work under the assumption the money is always better in your hands than someone else's. Mm. So I, I negotiate as a matter of course, a 5% cash deposit um, for my buyers, definitely. Mm. But then there's um, people that say, if you put a 5% deposit down and let's say in the settlement pe period, if you're doing evaluation and there is, or you know, in that formal approval process, there is some um, issue that arises that ends up resulting in you not being able to complete the purchase you're still on the hook for the 10%, right? So does, does it make a difference? Yeah, it's a good question. So what lawyers do, we, we, since 5% deposits started becoming popular, what lawyers for vendors now do regularly is they put this crafty clause in the contracts that say, look, we'll accept 5% when you sign the contract, but you're actually liable for the other five as a strict demand payment if you don't settle. And that, that what there's a, there's a big, there's a, there's a real importance with that because the strict demand is a very easy process to try and enforce. If I have to sue you for other damages that flow from a breach of contract, sometimes it can be years and years of litigation. So the, the that's strict demand, yeah, black and yeah, white. Yeah, strict demand's black and white. Here, you, you, you paid me five, uh, you owe me another five, you've got to pay me. And is that, you said some lawyers do it, so it's not across I, the board I, or I, it's I, sort of now standard? It's, it's almost standard. I'd say sort of 95%. We'll put this clause in there that says you can pay 5% on exchange but you still owe the other 5%. Now, you gotta be careful with this, Theo, because um, particularly if we're talking to vendors for a little minute, um, I wouldn't get too much false confidence about these clauses because you could have a clever clause in it that says you owe 10%, but the reality is if the buyer has defaulted, well, they're probably broke. So good luck mm. trying to get that money back. So mm. I always say, look, cash in hand, mm. you know, if, if it's a 5% deposit, you should assume that's all you're getting. My advice is different if you're a buyer. I would definitely be saying to them, look, don't be too cocky. Don't, don't think you can walk away from this with only putting 5% down and losing it because there is a clause there that the vendor is able to invoke mm. where you can, be, you can owe another 5%. And also, the vendor can also sue you for other damages. Mm. You know? So, um, yeah. Other damages. So that, that's, let's, let's elaborate on that because that's, um, that's something that's been interesting in a... In a uh, downward market uh, in, in terms of downward property prices and downward property trend. Um, we've had clients that uh, big risk that was happening at the start of this downward trend, which was um, the start of the interest rate rises, start just around the federal election last year, mid last year. Um, a lot of people still had that bullish confidence from that you know, COVID run and that COVID boom. And they were uh, buying uh, properties, buying a new home with a extended settlement and assuming um, that they will be able to sell their current property in that settlement period. Um, an assumption that people, you know, we've been witnessing people been making that for over 10 years and it, it's normally fine. Um, but for the first time ever last year, we saw that those assumptions in that sort of bullish, confident position was um, not that easy to, to then, you know, work through. So what I mean by that is that uh, when they went to sell their property, they couldn't quite get the... Um, price they wanted or worse of all at that start around the election and um, the, the hysteria that the media created around property the property market crashing there was actually just no one on their property whatsoever and some of these people we saw just considered foregoing their five or ten percent deposit mm. 
But the problem was that it wasn't just the 5 or 10% deposit that they were being warned that they're going to be on the hook for because if they have to, if the vendor has to resell the property and then because we're in a downward property market, they sell the property for less after, then you're on the hook for the difference, right? 100%. Yeah, 100%. So um, practically, there's a, a lot of litigation that needs to take place to actually establish that loss. Um, you know, you will need to... As a vendor, you'll need to prove to the buyer that you've u exhausted all reasonable measures to sell the property at the best possible price, and you'll have affidavits from real estate agents and all this kind of thing. But 100%, when you breach a contract, whether it's a contract for land or it's another contract that you that in the economy, um, you are liable for the damages that are incurred by the other person. Which is uh, lower price the vendor might accept, agent fees, legal uh, fees, legal fees, you know, everything. So, yeah, yeah, it becomes a, a, so a, a it's nasty. Never, yeah. it, it, honestly, it's never our advice unless there's a carefully structured clause to this effect, but it's never our advice just to walk away from a contract. How uh, how often have you seen that? Because to be honest, I've, I've, I've seen people entertain the idea and have to you know work through the concept, but I haven't uh, actually seen it go to a uh, legal dispute. Have you seen it often? A, a couple of times I've seen it, yeah. yeah. In, in the sort of 10,000 odd deals I've done, I've seen it. Um, That's good. There needs Very to low be, percentage. Yeah, <laughs> there, there needs to be a fair bit of loss there yeah. to really motivate the vendor to go and get there because it's not a cheap um, sort of um, in, in action to pursue. Um, you know, you, you're really thinking up around the three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollar loss before the vendor thinks, uh, look, I'm going to sue this guy in court, as opposed to trying to pursue some kind of out of court remedy, which is mm. the vast majority of what, uh, the occasions we, we sort of do that. Mm. We sort of say, look, give us the deposit and give us our legals. That generally, ninety percent of the time, that's that's sort of the resolution. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's move on to uh, deposit bonds. So whilst we're speaking about five yeah, or ten percent yeah. deposits, um, we were talking about you know. Uh, so firstly, a lot of people don't even know what a deposit bond is. So, um, you know, let's let's cover that. And a deposit bond is actually an insurance policy, really. That's all it is. Um, yeah. And it's for those people that, let's say, in that situation that we just mentioned, you're buying a property, but you need to sell yours first, and you don't actually have the cash for the deposit. Um, you can take out a deposit bond, being an insurance policy, to give to the uh, vendor, the owner of the property you're purchasing, um, which basically guarantees that you're good for the deposit on settlement. Um, what's your advice to vendors and, and buyers using those? Yeah, well, that's exactly what it is. Um, a couple of years ago, these were not very common, not very popular. Um, they're, they're more popular now for that exact reason, that there's so much cash tied up in equity in houses that people just don't have the ability to be able to go and put a deposit on another property. So that was the inception of these, these products. Um, I was a little bit skeptical to start with. You know, they're not cheap. They're probably a couple of thousand dollars to actually buy. Mm. But the more I've looked into it, I actually really like them. Mm. Um, and I, I like them actually particularly, not only for the efficiency for buyers, but I actually like them for vendors too. And the reason for this is, you know, using that scenario that you sort of mentioned before, where you've got a vendor who has who is selling a property to a purchaser and he's got, let's say, for example, he's got a cash deposit of 10%. And with that cash deposit of 10% or that contract, he's gone and bought another property and it's all, it's all due to settle simultaneously. If his sale doesn't go through, his purchase doesn't go through. I, I get very nervous about mm. these transactions. Now, the domino effect. No, exactly, the domino effect. Now, imagine at settlement date, your purchaser pulls out. He says, look, I've lost my job. I can't settle. I'm really sorry. Now, what the first thing that the vendor should do is go and terminate the contract and take the cash deposit. Now, a big misconception in the market is how quickly it takes to do that. Mm. Okay, even with the best will in the world, even with the most compliant buyer, and most of the time they're not compliant, most of the time they try and muddy the waters legally, it's, there's still a process with the real estate agent to try and get that money out. They, they basically, they need to effectively um, something slightly less than an affidavit from both sides saying the contract has been in breach and, and getting indemnified and all that kind of thing. It can take anywhere between maybe uh, a few days at the earliest to months and months. Sometimes at worst, it takes litigation to get the deposit out of the agent's trust account because they are a stakeholder. They have to take the, they, they hold the property on trust for both parties and unless both parties consent to it, they're not going to release that money. Now, in the meantime, while these shenanigans are going on, 
you've got a, a purchase transaction which you've just defaulted on. Yeah, you've, got, right. you've been issued a notice to complete. Yep. You're being charged penalty yep. interest on a daily basis. The interest you, you're, you're being charged is probably going to, if you're upsizing, it's going to be more than the interest you're charging onto your, your Correct. purchaser. You, you need that money ASAP. You mm. need to be able to give it on to your, to your buyer, uh, sorry, to your vendor of your purchase and being, you need to be able to structure some bridging finance or something like that. So that's why I prefer deposit bonds in that scenario because you can circumvent the agent. You go straight to one of the deposit bond providers. I think they're called Deposit Power, Deposit Assure. I think they're backed by QBE. But you walk into their, their, their shop and you say, the, vent, the buyer has defaulted. Here is my deposit bond and they will pay you straight away. Can we just elaborate on that, yeah. right? So uh, just for those out, out there that, you know, not too um, savvy with this process and most buyers aren't, even if they've bought before. Um, so if you default on settlement, you miss settlement, standard in New South Wales is a two-week notice to complete or is Correct. that also sort of... That's no, it's, it's almost always 14 days. Yeah, yep. I don't think I've seen one other than 14 days. Yeah. 14 days. So you're saying on not on the 14th day, but on the, the expected settlement date, you could do that? No, no, sorry. Sorry if I, if I didn't explain that correctly. No, it would have to be on the 14th day. On the 14th yeah. day. Yeah. Whereas... Um, but it would be on the 14th day. That's the important point. It would be on... Whereas trying to get the cash deposit from the agent, you'd be lucky to get that on day 21, I think. Which is, yeah. which is crucial because if you've organised a simultaneous settlement being for the purchase of your new property and the sale of, of the other... Uh, of your current, then that 14 day also lines exactly. up exactly with the, exactly. the other one. So, exactly. Exactly. so it's crucial uh, to, to have that flexibility. Um, wow, lots to know. Scary subject. I think the, um, the, the, the key from this is you need good advice and you need yeah. uh, the right, the right um, legal team behind you because I feel um, some people even, I, I feel actually where we see more um, issues or, or errors in the process is actually not from first home buyers because first home buyers are very weary, very nervous and making sure they get the right advice. It's probably the more... Keep their bets small. Yeah, yeah keep yeah. their bets small. It's probably the, the, the person that's done it once or twice and goes in a little bit ignorant, ignorantly and, and a bit too confident and then just has that she'll be right type attitude, right? 100%. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. The other thing... Mm. Theo, I think the, the big takeaway or the big, the big bit of advice, gen general advice in property transactions, I think, is time kills, right? The longer that you let something to go wrong, the more likely it will go wrong. So all these sort of disaster cases where you sort of, you, you buy and then you look to sell and that kind of thing, the vast majority of these transactions are structured with 90, 100 day settlement, transac um, mm. settlement periods. So during that period, anything could change. Mm. You, know, you can have that, that period that we had a couple of years ago where the market just tanks. Mm. You could lose your job. You know, yeah. One of your partners could pass away. We've, we've had that terrible situation happen before. So, so you want to, I really think for my clients, you really want to keep your settlement that periods short, if you yeah. can. Even, even if you're a purchaser. Especially from a bank financing mm. point of view, we're seeing that um, a lot of people being the confident and more probably ignorant ones in the sense that they buy, take a long settlement, they leave. In um, Melbourne, we, we've got... Um, some people that buy property that don't even have their finance approved when they purchase it, but because they have that cooling off period, they assume it'll be sorted in that two-week period. They only lose the the 0.25%. Mm -hmm. um, but um, even here in Sydney, when they sign a 66W and they've you know committed to the purchase unconditionally, we're seeing that um, in that, let's say, I feel like uh, settlement periods have blown out a little bit. Six Definitely. weeks used to be the standard, 42 days. It's yep. It's now more like 10 to 12, I feel, here locally. Yeah, um, I agree with that. We, we definitely perceived that in the last 12 months. Yeah, and I feel like uh, some people don't sort of start formalizing their finance straight away. And in an um, increasing rate environment that we're seeing right now, your borrowing power is subsequently decreasing. And if your approval lapses in that extended settlement period, then you have to reapply uh, you're most likely going to be getting a, a lower amount approved because we've had 10 consecutive rate rises and each rate rise has a, 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 um, a <coughs> negative effect on your borrowing power. So um, that is good advice. I think if, you, if you're going to uh, commit to a long settlement, make sure you're, you know what you're committing to and that your bank is across the detail and that you know um, it, 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 the risk involved are, are aligned with your objective, right? That's right. All right. So we've covered a lot of points there. We've, um, I, my next comment was to talk about claiming of deposits, but I feel like we've already touched on that and, and sort of covered it. Um, but did you want to elaborate, you know, for if, if people do get into that situation where someone does 
um, you know, default and you can't commit, especially in this current climate. Is there anything else we didn't really cover? I think the big takeaway is you've got to realise it's not an instantaneous proje- um, process. Mm. Um, there's very, very few times where you can just literally write to the agent and say, the buyer's mm. defaulted. Can you give me the 10% or the 5%? Um, because the agent will almost always say, well, I need the buyer's consent to that. And you sort of say, well, what do you mean? The buyer's defaulted. Well, no, we've got to hear it from the buyer and the buyer's solicitor. And 90% of the time, the buyer and the buyer's solicitor will try and muddy the waters. Of course they will. And they'll say, no, you you didn't tell me about this or this didn't happen or Mm. this happened to me and it's not fair. And what that means is at at the best, it's going to be a three or four day delay. And at the worst, you could end up in court. Mm. Um, because the agent at one point would have said, look, this is all too much for me. We can't decide who's right, so we're going to pay the deposit into the Supreme Court. That's what actually happens. They'll actually transfer the money to the Supreme Court and say, you guys go off to court and sort it out yourself. Wow, what a way to put a bit of taste on a beautiful experience of buying a new home, right? Yeah, yeah. That just actually reminded me, there was something else I wanted to um, touch on with you because it was something that you helped us um, put in one of our newsletters that was the... Uh, most engaging content we've put on our SEO optimization too. So um, releasing of mm. deposit. Um, so to elaborate on this, so if effectively if you uh, sometimes are purchasing a property, the vendor, the owner of the property that you're buying um, the property from might choose to request that you release the 5 or 10% deposit that you're paying down upfront prior to settlement. Um, they might need that money to go on and put down as a deposit on their new purchase. Uh, I've, I'm seeing it become more commonly requested these days. What's your thoughts on that? I agree. It definitely is. Um, and I think it's partly to do, again, with the phenomena we mentioned before where there's just been so much cash tied up in household equity. Mm. Um, people just don't have that cash lying around to buy their next property. So they put a term in the contract that says, if you pay me a 10% deposit or a 5% deposit, um, I get the right to put my hand into the, the jar on day one and go and spend that on the deposit on another property uh, in New South Wales. Now, from a, from a vendor's perspective, that, that is, sounds convenient, it, sound, it makes sense. From a buyer's perspective, we don't like it. Mm. Um, it does incorporate a risk. And I have had clients lose money before because Let's of elaborate on that risk. What do you mean by that? Okay, well, let, let me give you an example. Um, it's a bit of a horror story that happened quite a few years ago. There was a, a property up in the Blue Mountains we were working on with a buyer. Um, again, longer settlement date. Always beware of the longer settlement date. So I think it was a, a 90-day settlement period. And the vendor was absolutely adamant that he would only accept the price that we're offering if there was going to be a release of deposit in there. He wanted to buy a property in the Shire. So... We advised against it, but the uh, the purchaser was very keen to proceed. So we signed this contract, 90-day settlement with a release of deposit clause. Now, that was pretty much it. You know, we waited the, we waited to day 80 or 80, 85, and we, we got on PEXA, which is our electronic settlement platform, and to see how the, the vendor is, um, is faring ahead of settlement. And we could see that he had quite a few banks on the uh, lined up on the PEXA workspace, and, and actually non-bank lenders as well, which is a bit terrifying. Um, Anyway, the date for settlement came and went, um, and we sort of said, well, what's going on here? Why can't you discharge these these mortgages? And he said, well, we've got some disputes with our, oh. our banks. And we're like, oh, wow. God, well, what do you mean? Said, oh, it's all under control. Don't worry about it. And anyway, this went on for weeks and weeks and weeks, um, we, we, and we just couldn't have the, 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 the transaction completed. So we said, look, you, this is a mess. You've obviously got a, a massive debt problem. You've got all these prior ranking securities that we can't, well, you can't discharge. So we want the, we want the contract terminated because it was meant to settle you know, quite a few weeks ago. We want our money back. And he went, well, about that. <laughs> Jeez. I've actually bought that property down in the Shire. And yes, I am in financial difficulty. And, and I actually had my, my contract terminated down there. So your money is lost. So we're talking that was a couple of hundred grand. Oh um, my god! So that that's, actually that, happens. That's a sharky character that's de- <laughs> deliberately done that plan, right? Like that yeah. Is... Look, it might have been deliberate. He might have been, you know, shambolic. He might have been a bit of both. In hindsight, Theo, I, 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 I do see some risk factors now, which I would, would, would always, would I definitely sort of um, just simply walk away from nowadays. The first one was the non-bank lenders on the title, mm. so they didn't have, um, you know, CBA Westpac, or he had. I think Mango Mortgages and a few other of these sort of yeah, wow. uh, these lenders some on there. Private so, lenders. so clearly yeah. he was in some kind of financial distress from the outset. So the more financial distress that they're in, the less likely the vendor is able to give clean title at settlement. Let's just elaborate on that too. Um, <coughs> forgive me, I keep to keep saying let's elaborate, but um, 
a lot of people think that you buy a property, you're getting a loan from the bank and that's it. But this day and age, uh, financing against assets has become a lot more um, vast in terms of options and you can take second and third mortgages against properties. Um, so what I mean by that is that you might have a loan for a million dollar property of 600 grand with Commonwealth Bank, but then you can go get another 100 or 200 grand from you know, any Tom, Dick and Harry really that's willing to take a second priority behind that, that um, first mortgage. Um, tell me, do you do title searches or anything to, to um, advise your clients do with this risk because if the property is being sold for more than those lenders are um, uh, uh, entitled to, I mean, sorry, other way around, if the property is being sold for less than the title, the, 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 um, mm. those lenders are entitled to, th there can be that dispute that you're mm. referring to. It's not normally as big a risk as you'd think um, unless you have parted with some money or unless you have gone onto the property and done some works or in some improvements ahead of settlement, which sometimes happens. It's not normally a risk because at settlement, the vendor, one of the, the solemn covenants that you give under a contract is the vendor must give clean title. So to some extent, I don't really care if he's got three or four mortgages on there because they're all coming off at settlement. If they don't come off at settlement, I terminate the contract and I get my money back. That's assuming I haven't parted with my money, right? And this is what ha happened in that case. The money had gone out of the trust account of the agent. It had gone somewhere else. So, yes, it, look, I wouldn't say it's an ideal situation when I pick up a contract and I see, you know, three or four mortgages on there. I, I would mention it to my client, but I, I wouldn't say it's a deal breaker unless the contract requires him to part with some of his money before settlement. Mm. <clears throat> All right. Good to know. Good advice. Well, Jared, you've been fantastic. Thanks for coming on board to our Property and Finance um, podcast. Um, guys, if you want to speak to Jared, we've got a... Uh, uh, details on our his details on our website. Reach out to us. Um, you're operating across the whole east coast of Australia now, I believe. That's correct. Even inland, you know, yep. almost yep. All, almost the Northern Territory, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can, we can do all states and territories. Not yeah. much in Northern Territory going on at the moment, but uh, we can do it. Yep. Yeah. So if you've got any questions, please feel free to uh, reach out to Jared. So, Jared, thanks for 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 joining us. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.